In the wee hours of the morning on the 1st of June in 2009, Air France uh, Flight 447 was on its way from Rio de Janeiro to Paris with 228 passengers on board. Uh, three of those passengers actually were young Irish doctors. Uh, they were on their way back uh, from their holidays and seemingly had their whole lives before them. Now, the three pilots on this flight were all uh, operating on very little sleep. And in fact, earlier in the evening, uh, the captain, Mark Dubois, had commented uh, to his colleagues, he said that one hour of sleep is not enough. And he was very right. Now, you see, uh, Dubois, who was a married man, had been enjoying the pleasures of sin uh, the night before. Uh, he and his illicit lover had been partying in the nightclubs of Rio de Janeiro and had gotten less than an hour of sleep. And so, uh, about three hours into the flight, he said, okay, I've got to get a nap. And he excused himself, and he went back uh, into the cabin to get a nap. Uh, and he left his two uh, much less experienced uh, co-pilots, Pierre Bodin and David Robert, or uh, Robert, I guess you how you say, uh, in charge of the cockpit. Now, uh, Bodin was nervous about uh, the storm that they were flying in. Uh, and uh, he asked Dubois if, you know, should we uh, rise to 37,000 feet to get above the storm? And uh, Dubois, who had been through many storms, saw no need to do this. And so he said, no, just, let's just stay at 35,000 feet. And so uh, he went to bed. Little did Dubois and Bonin and Robert and then 225 other people on that plane realize that they literally were only moments away from departing this world. Flying through a storm uh, in the mid-Atlantic would normally be a routine occurrence and usually poses no problem, but on this particular night, uh, the high concentration of air crystals and the clouds had caused the, um, the airspeed um, sensors to clog, and as a result, uh, the airspeed sensors stopped functioning correctly and the readings became invalid, and this caused the, uh, the autopilot and the auto thrust to switch off suddenly at 2.10 a.m. So without this luxury, these two relatively inexperienced co-pilots were now in charge of keeping the plane in the air. Uh, they began to panic and they made a series of very bad decisions, not uh, trusting the instruments, which actually were functioning properly. Uh, they climbed too rapidly to an altitude of 38,000 feet, uh, which caused the plane to stall in the thin uh, atmosphere and then to begin to nosedive. Well, at this point, the co-pilots were just absolutely paralyzed with fear. Uh, as they tried to process the information. They no longer knew whether they were climbing or descending. They desperately uh, hit the call button for the captain uh, to come to the cockpit. And by the time he got there, it was too late to undo the deadly mistakes that had already been made. As Dubois came into the cockpit, uh, Robert uh, yelled, he said, we completely uh, lost control of the airplane and we don't understand anything. We tried everything. They were now plunging at 10,000 feet per minute toward the ocean. Sensors were blurring warnings and no one was thinking coherently. And then Boney cried out. He said, we're going to crash. This can't be true, but what's happening? And then with a curse, he cried out, we're dead. And sure enough, just seconds later, 2.14 a.m., the plane slammed into the Atlantic Ocean and 228 souls had an appointment with God. Whether they were ready for it or not, they had an appointment with God that, that night. Their time in this world had run out. And folks, time is running out all the time. Time is running out to fulfill the Great Commission, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I like to talk about the fact that time is running out for the lost to be saved, that time is running out for the saved to reach the lost, and also time is running out for this church age. Now, this morning, we're going to focus on the fact that time is running out for the lost. Let's begin by reading from Hebrews chapter 9, to verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 27. Paul says here, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Paul says that it's appointed unto men once to die. The first point I'd like to talk about this morning is that every man has an appointment with death. Now, probably no one on that flight had any thought that that night would be the last night on earth. Uh, the words of Pierre Bodine said it all. He said, we're going to crash. This can't be true. As the stark reality of what was about to happen uh, came upon him, he just did not want to believe that his time was actually up. And so it is with most people. Most people think that they have plenty of time um, in this world to enjoy the pleasures of this world, and they rarely give a thought to 
for what's coming afterward. But God's word brings us back to reality. The Apostle James said, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, uh, we will go into such a city and continue there uh, for a year and uh, buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and that vanisheth away. We all have an appointment, an appointment with our Creator and our Judge. It doesn't matter whether you believe that you have this appointment coming or not. It will come, uh, whether you're prepared or not. As Jesus was preaching to the crowds one day, he spoke a parable about a rich farmer who uh, spent all his time acquiring things in this world and did not think about God. So look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 16. Luke chapter 12 and verse 16. And we'll read down to verse 21. Luke 12, 16 through 21. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy means, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. In Luke chapter 12, verse 1, the first verse of this, this chapter here, we're told that as Jesus was speaking this day, the people, uh, there was such a loud, or so large a crowd of people that were coming to see him that people literally were treading on each other to come see him. And yet, how many of the people in that enormous crowd really heeded what Jesus said that day? Probably not many. And how do I know that? Well, because the nature of man back then is the same as, as it is now. Um, you know, not many people think about the hereafter. You know, you don't have to be wealthy to be like the foolish farmer in Jesus' parable. All you have to do is just have his philosophy of, of life. And the farmer's philosophy was that this world is the end all. He thought that life was all about pursuing ease and comfort and enjoyment, uh, and that uh, he, he uh, did not think about God. He did not consider that the wages of sin is death. He didn't stop to consider that because he had told lies, because he had had envious thoughts, uh, because he had cursed or hated people in his heart or committed adultery with his eyes or coveted or set up idols in his heart, that he just might be in trouble with God. This man may well have been outwardly moral in people's eyes, but his heart was filled with sin, just like anybody else. Jesus said, from within, from out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride and foolishness. The farmer had not given thought to the most important thing, and that was being ready to meet God. If you're not saved, I'm here to warn you that you have an appointment. It's appointed unto you once to die, and after this the judgment. And furthermore, there are only two kinds of judgments. There's a judgment uh, for the saved. Uh, they will be saved, uh, they will be judged uh, for the things that they did for Christ. They will suffer loss for the things they did not do for him. We were talking about that yesterday in the men's prayer breakfast. But then there's also the great white throne judgment. Uh, and only the lost will stand before God in that judgment. And without the blood of Christ to cover them, they will be eternally separated from God. So look at Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. So the most sobering words in the entire Bible. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from his face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, I don't know everyone in this room, and I hope that everyone here knows the Lord, but if there's a chance that somebody doesn't, I'm here to warn you, uh, don't end up 
this judgment. Uh, Jesus shed his precious blood to wash away your sin. He died and rose again, conquering death for you. And he's made salvation possible. All you have to do is receive him. By simply repenting of your sin, that means inwardly turning to Christ from sin and saying, I don't want my sin anymore. I want Christ to take my sin away. I want him to be my Lord now. It's called repentance. And then simply believing, trusting in him alone to save you. Stop trusting in your good works. Stop thinking you're a good person and just trust in him to save you. Now, if you are saved, please do not switch off your mind at this point because this message really is mostly going to be directed to you. Uh, if you're saved, then you are secure in Christ. But lost souls all around you are heading toward a Christless eternity. Day by day, hour by hour, they're marching toward an appointment with God. And you uh, have only a limited time to reach them with the gospel. Uh, <clears throat> does that thought weigh on your mind often? It should. It should. Uh, and it's my prayer that you will allow God to transform your thinking during this missions conference today. Now, every day, lost people slip into eternity and have facing an appointment with God uh, that they, most of uh, the, well, they're not saved, they're not ready for. And as God's people, we must be motivated by that thought. Secondly, this morning, I'd like to make the point that every Christian is given appointments to preach the gospel. Every Christian is given appointments to preach the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul reminded the Christians in the church of Corinth, he said that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. But that wasn't the end of, of Paul's thought there. Not only does the Father reconcile the lost to himself through his Son, but he uses believers to bring the lost to his Son. Paul went on to explain that God hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That word committed is translated from a word that can also be said appointed. Uh, so think of that. God has appointed you to be uh, in the ministry of bringing others to his son so that he might reconcile them to God the Father. Paul says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did, be did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. God has appointed us as ambassadors to go into a darkened world and to deliver this message. We beseech you, be reconciled to God. Now, think of the implications of that truth. If we um, have been divinely appointed to this business, then this means that we have divine appointments, specific opportunities, appointments. First of all, it means that we have appointments to present the gospel to people personally. Every day, we should be asking the Lord to give us appointments with lost souls so that uh, we might present them with the gospel. Uh, that's the way Paul looked at life. He was always on the lookout for opportunities to share the gospel with people. I'm not going to turn to Acts chapter 16 because I think we covered that pretty thoroughly last night, but uh, that whole, I'm just going to recap uh, the story. Uh, Paul, of course, um, we, we know earlier in that chapter, it says that Paul gave, uh, was given uh, a commandment by God to go over into Macedonia and to help the people there. God closed the door to a couple places, to uh, Bithynia and to Asia, but instead he called them to Macedonia. Now that was enough for Paul. Uh, Paul did not shrug off these thoughts as just a, a mere coincidence. He didn't say, well, Macedonia is a Roman colony uh, under direct Roman law, and you know, that'd be too dangerous to go over there. So you know, besides, there are Christians over here that, that need tending and, and discipleship, and so I'll well, just stay over here. No, he obeyed God. He went where God wanted him to go. And when he got there, uh, the Lord led him through Samothracia and then Neapolis and then Philippi uh, to the bank of a river where he met Lydia, a woman that God had been preparing. The Bible says that God had opened her heart so that she would receive the gospel. Uh, and her family, she and her family, ended up getting saved that day. There was an appointment, an exact time, an exact place that God led Paul and his missionary team to. But not only that, God had another divine appointment for Paul and Silas there in Philippi. He also wanted them to go to a jailer in his family. However, this wasn't going to be a piece of cake. In order for this appointment to happen, they had to be arrested, they had to be stripped naked, they had to be beaten, and then put into the darkest part of a jail and tightly bound with stocks. Now put yourself in Paul and Silas's shoes. Uh, would you feel like witnessing to a man who had beaten you until you were lacerated and bleeding and raw and had placed uh, bands or stocks on your hands and your feet uh, in the darkest part of the prison. Now, many Christians probably would have said, I'm not going to give the gospel to that man. He doesn't deserve it. 
Uh, besides, I'm in pain, and I don't feel like talking right now to anybody. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm done. Would you have had that attitude? I think we all might have been tempted to have that attitude. And yet that wasn't Paul and Silas' attitude. Even in their pain, they, they shared the gospel with this man. And we know that they must have already shared the gospel with him because when the earthquake happened and the man came in to, to them and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Uh, obviously, he knew how, that he needed to be saved. He had heard that somewhere. Uh, There's only one person that could have told him that. It was Paul and Silas. Uh, he had, oh, they had already been sharing the gospel with him earlier that day. Uh, and so not only did they give them the, uh, this man the gospel, but that night his whole family uh, received Christ as Savior. Paul and Silas were always thinking about people's souls. The very fact that they didn't try to escape after their shackles fell off and the prison doors opened uh, shows how sensitive they were uh, to the needs of others. I mean, this was their golden opportunity for them to make a jailbreak, right? Uh, but they didn't because they knew that this man uh, was under obligation as, as uh, uh, you know, by Roman law, that if anybody escaped under his watch, that he would be put to death. And they knew that if they were to run away, this man would be put to death. And they said, don't harm yourself, as the man was trying to commit suicide. He said, harm not yourself, we're all here. And they shared the gospel with them. And they received Christ as Savior and were baptized. Brethren, God has appointed us to share the gospel with people, and we must be ready to seize those opportunities. But that's not all. God has also appointed us to send forth laborers to take the gospel to places that we cannot go. Let's look at Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 17. Romans chapter 10, and verses 9 through 17. Verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let's look at Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Acts 13, 1 through 4. Starting in verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted, uh, as they ministered uh, to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now, in Romans there, Paul asked that rhetorical question, how shall they believe on him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall they preach except they be sent? Now, that raises an important question. Who does the sending? Well, God does. It's the Lord who calls believers to leave their home and to take the gospel to other places. But we must not forget that God sends his laborers through the institution that he has ordained. And that institution is the local church. As we saw there in Acts chapter 13, they ordained Paul uh, and Silas to go uh, into, or Barnabas rather, to go into other places and take the gospel. Uh, God has commissioned churches to send forth missionaries. There's no other institution that God has given that responsibility. Uh, nor are Christians to go out on their own as lone rangers. Right. Uh, all believers are to submit to the authority of a local church, first of all, by being baptized, becoming a member, uh, and then by serving the Lord within the body. God's plan is that churches preach the gospel uh, to the lost and then lead them to Christ, baptize them, and teach them to observe all things that he's commanded, and then send forth laborers to start new churches, and then those new churches start new churches, and so on. 
Um, <clears throat> this is God's plan. This is God's pattern. Like the Church of Philippi, which uh, supported the Apostle Paul as their missionary. Uh, your church here supports missionaries. Uh, and that is great that you have a part of that. Uh, but we must do more than just support uh, missionaries financially. We should be praying that the Lord would send forth more laborers into his harvest. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Matthew 9, verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore of the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now the interesting thing is here is that in the very next chapter, the beginning of chapter 10, uh, Jesus did send forth laborers. He sent the disciples, his 12 disciples, to go and preach uh, the gospel throughout the cities of Israel. Uh, and so if he knew that he was going to send them, why did he say that we need to pray for this? Mm -hmm. Well, because when God, whenever God commissions you to pray for laborers, you need to be willing to accept that maybe I yes. am going to be sent. Yes. It's, it's one thing to pray that I will send somebody else, but what if it's you? Mm -hmm. uh, whenever you pray for laborers, you need to be willing to go yourself. Um, <clears throat> brethren, don't ever think that God cannot use you. When God sent Moses to Pharaoh, uh, what, what did Moses do? He objected that he was a man of slow speech and of a slow tongue. He said, who hath, and God responded to him, he said, who hath made man's mouth? Or who uh, maketh the dumb, the deaf, or the seeing, of the, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. God doesn't need super talented people. He merely needs those who, like Isaiah, will say, Here am I, send me, and then allow him to equip us for the work. God can use anyone who is willing to be used by him. Take, for example, a man named Ko Tabu. Uh, Ko Tabu was a man who was led to the Lord by Ed and Iron Judson, the Baptist missionary who took the gospel to Burma in the early 1800s. Ko Tabu was once a slave, but Judson freed him uh, with his own money and then led him to Christ. Akota Bu had been a murderer. In fact, he had killed about 30 people. Uh, and yet God totally changed and transformed this man. Uh, shortly after Akota Bu uh, had received Christ, he went back to his own people, a jungle tribe called the Karens, uh, in company with Judson's missionary friend, George Boardman, and many people were saved Amen. through his witness. Now, how did an illiterate man like Akota Bu accomplish this? Well, for one thing, God had been preparing the hearts of the Karens to receive the gospel for a long time. Even though they were idol worshippers, they still had little nuggets of truth that had been passed down through the centuries. They believed that there was an unchangeable, eternal, all-powerful God, creator of heaven and earth, who formed the first man and the first woman from the dust of the earth and created the first woman from the man's rib. They believed that the first man was tempted by the devil, to eat from a tree of death and thus fell into sin. They believed that the Creator promised, uh, promised this first man that a Savior would come someday. They believed that this God, whom they called Yomah, which is very interesting since it sounds very much like Yehovah, right? Jehovah. Um, but they said that this God, Yomah, had promised mankind that uh, He would send them a, a, a Savior, a Messiah, to rescue them from their sin. Uh, they believed that the Karen people had once had a sacred scroll, a holy book. Um, which had contained the knowledge of this God uh, and the coming Messiah, but they believed that the father of the Karen tribe had carelessly lost that scroll many centuries ago. And so they were literally waiting for a foreigner to come from outside and bring them this message. Well, needless to say, they were very open to the gospel when they heard it. Uh, the Karens readily received the gospel, and many of them were saved. The truths that God had given to Adam 6,000 years ago had not been entirely lost to these people. Uh, they had just enough memory of the true God, but they realized that they didn't know who he was, and they needed to find out, and they needed to be reconciled to him. God sent the right man at the right time to give them the gospel. And yet this man was not educated. Uh, he was not talented. He couldn't even read. Uh, he was an illiterate Karen who believed that Jesus died and rose again. And he took 
the Great Commission seriously. Folks, that is the kind of God that we serve. God will use whoever will surrender his or her ambitions and will and heart to him. What if Judson had not answered God's call to Burma? Or what if uh, he had allowed the sufferings that he had endured in Burma already, such as being imprisoned uh, and tortured and losing his wife Anne and his three children in sickness, what if he had allowed all that to make him bitter and to cause him to give up and go back to America? What if Boardman had not answered God's call to Burma? And what if the churches that supported Judson and Boardman had not supported them, thus making it impossible for them to go there? Kota would never have been saved and would not have been given the gospel and then would not have taken the gospel to his own tribe. Their long-awaited appointment with the gospel, which God had been orchestrating for centuries, would have been missed. Mm -hmm. That's a mind-boggling thought, isn't it? And that brings me to the last point, point number three, and that is that appointments can be made or missed. Right. They can actually be missed. You say, wait a minute, how, how does that reconcile with the sovereignty of God? Well, I can't explain it, but all I know is that we have a free will, right. and we can choose. Uh, to disobey. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 3, 16 through 21. Ezekiel chapter 3, 16 through 21. Verse 16. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word of my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy name. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thy hand. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation, but it does mean, like we were saying yesterday, you're going to have to give an answer for that at the judgment seat. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin, uh, sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely die, because he is warned. Also, thou hast delivered thy soul. The words of warning that we just read were given to an Old Testament prophet uh, who was commissioned to preach to the house of Israel, uh, who were scattered in captivity. But the principle behind it is just as real to us in the New Testament age as it was to Ezekiel. All of us have been commissioned to be Sufim, to be watchmen, except that we are commissioned to go not just to uh, the nation of Israel, but to all tribes and nations. God has uh, appointments for us, and we need to make those appointments on time. Now let's start with the good news. The good news is that it is possible to make our appointments. In August of 2018, when uh, Sean and Timothy and I were out preaching and handing out tracts at the Golden Island in Athlone, uh, there was a young uh, Indian man who came and started listening, and um, he was intrigued because he saw people walking by and nobody seemed to be paying attention to us, uh, and yet we continued uh, to preach and sing and hand out tracts. He's like, hmm, maybe they have something worth saying if they're that determined. Uh, and so he came to our church and started listening, and uh, over a period of a few months, uh, um, he, he realized his need of Christ and personally received Christ as a Savior. He's now baptized and serving the Lord. Uh, so that was an appointment that was made. It was the right time. It was the right place. Uh, in the late 90s, a Christian uh, named Nick Ripken visited a Muslim country, and he couldn't tell the name of the country for uh, sake of uh, security reasons, but uh, he tried to find Christians in that country because he wanted to hear their salvation stories and encourage them. Well, somehow or other, uh, a man from a remote jungle uh, tribe uh, had heard about Ripken, and he traveled 29 hours to find him. Uh, this man, and Nipkin just called him Pramana, uh, told him that five years earlier his wife, uh, uh, sorry, his life was falling apart. He was uh, just about to divorce his wife. Uh, even his crops were, uh, were failing and his cattle were dying. And he was looking for answers. He wanted to know God. And so he asked his imam what to do. 
the Imam uh, instructed him to pray and to fast for three days, and on the third day he said that he would receive an answer from Allah. Uh, and so that's what he did. He prayed for, for three days and fasted, and on the third day he did get his answer, except it wasn't from Allah. Yeah. It was from the true God. After midnight, Pramana heard a voice saying to him, quote, find Jesus, find the gospel. Now, Pramana uh, had no idea who Jesus was, but this voice told him to, quote, get out of bed, go over the mountain, and walk down to the coast to such and such a city. Uh, and when you get to the city at daybreak, you will see two men. Uh, when you see these two men, ask them where such and such a street is. Uh, they will show you the way. Walk up and down the street and find this number. And when you find the number, knock on the door. When the door opens, tell the person why you have come. Well, Pramana uh, obeyed that voice immediately. He got up, didn't even tell his wife that he was leaving. He traveled for two weeks to find that house. When he knocked on the door, uh, he said, I've come to find Jesus. I've come to find the gospel. Now, the man in the house, he was an old man, uh, and he was a Christian, uh, but uh, he was a very, very skeptical. Um, this, <clears throat> this was a country of about 24 million people. Very few of them uh, were believers in Jesus Christ, and he was afraid that this might be a trap to incriminate him. Uh, nevertheless, he listened to Pramana's story and he shared the gospel with him. And wonder of wonders, the man got saved. Uh, the old man then uh, spent the next two weeks in discipling him. The old man could have passed up that appointment out of fear for his life. I mean, it's a very real fear in a country like that, but he didn't. The appointment was kept, and the soul was saved. Now, these are all happy stories, but before we close, I, I have one sad story to tell. It's a story that was told by Ralph, uh, Ralph Wynn, a missionary to the Tarahumara Indians of Mexico. Now, this man's, uh, by man's reasoning, uh, Wynn should not have even lived long enough to get uh, the, to the mission field. He had a rare lung disease, and the doctors predicted that he would not live for more than four years. Now, that was in the year 1956. And yet, he lived on. And in 1965, he and his family went to the Tarahumara Indians of Mexico. And for decades, they plotted on, showing the love of Christ to his precious people, and many souls were saved. God miraculously enabled Wim to live until the year 1992, so that he could reach them. But there was one time when he missed an appointment. Uh, Wim had been preaching and t uh, teaching classes in the village of Baca Guriz, and on the other side of the canyon, behind us at his home, uh, he, he was very tired, it had been a long day, and it was getting dark, and as he rode his horse uphill toward his home, uh, there was a lady who came out of an adobe house and asked him to teach her and her two little boys the word of God. Now, he felt that he was too tired to do that at that point, and so he promised that uh, he would stop by on his next trip. Well, shortly after this, there was a very heavy rain, uh, which made the river between him and her impassable. Several weeks passed by, but finally, uh, one of the men uh, that uh, had been led to the Lord by wind uh, took him to the river and helped him to get across. It was still very turbulent, but he managed to get across and after crossing the river, he saw the, the two little boys, uh, this, this woman coming out to meet him. And he asked them where their mother was. But he was shocked when they said, Mama's dead. Uh, her time was up. And when had missed that appointment with her. The words of Ezekiel 3.18 flooded his mind. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. And thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I require at thine hand. And he resolved that from that point on, he was never going to miss an appointment. Whenever we miss an appointment, it's not because there was an unfortunate circumstance that prevented it. If God has an appointment for us, he will open the door for it to happen. The problem is that we often fail to go to the door because we consider it to be too inconvenient for us. We tend to think that if an appointment did not happen, then it wasn't supposed to be. Uh, and yet, could it be that the appointment was supposed to be, but we did not take the opportunity. Uh, we don't like to entertain that thought because it smacks us square in the eyes with our responsibility. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It isn't God's will that anyone should perish, and thus the responsibility falls on us to seize every moment that Christ gives us. And so uh, that's my thought this morning as, as uh, I wind up. 
I, I hope that the Lord is, is, is uh, stirring your heart already and that he'll continue to, to work in your heart this morning. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, 